Hey, good morning. Good morning. Yes, I'm up here on the screen, but it's because I have a message for our entire church family today. And I'm so excited about what God's doing here in the Great Hall. David Frush with us today. Great to have you with us and uh, so thankful uh, that you're here. All of our guests, we're glad you're here. We had a great time last weekend. Uh, we had all the men in here and uh, all the women over in the sanctuary, and we had a great time. And ladies, I don't mind telling you, I was wondering how the guys were going to do without you. And it was amazing. I mean, they were singing. So if, if your husband, your boyfriend not singing today, he was killing it last week. So we had a great time. And Dr. Tony Evans with us and, and uh, Crystal, his daughter, we had a, we had a blast. So um, it's great to now get back on track. We're talking about the Moses model. And I have a message for, again, our entire church family today. And it's a rather prophetic message. Going to be a hard message to hear, frankly, but I think it's going to help answer some questions you may have in your mind, even some theological questions about the God of the Old Testament up against the God of the New Testament. Uh, it's going to be um, a challenging message today. So I want you to listen prayerfully. And you can go ahead and turn to the book of Exodus. We're looking at the life of Moses. But today, really, we're going to be focused on the Pharaoh. Now, here's the thing. When we look at the Old Testament and when you go back this far uh, in history, um, you, you start to think, man, these people, they're not quite as educated as us. They're not as modern as we are. You know, they're not as smart as we are. We kind of think of them, frankly, as kind of barbaric, kind of not real bright. And, and we look at the Old Testament as if we're so progressive, as if we've come so far. But what we're going to discover today is, no, no, no. First of all, the Egyptian culture was highly advanced culture, very intelligent and educated people, particularly the Pharaoh would have been among all of them. Uh, if some of you, like me, I've seen the pyramids. I mean, that would be a major feat in our day. I'm not even sure we could pull it off. We wouldn't have that kind of patience. We wouldn't have that kind of ability. Even today, it's crazy to think. And the mathematical precision by which the pyramids uh, are, were, were made. And whenever you see, you know, reliefs or pictures of the Egyptians uh, back in this time period, they're always just, I mean, they're, they're chilling. They're like laying by the pool. They got dogs. They got their pets walking around with them. And uh, they're living large. And it's true. And what we're going to see today is a very modern uh, question because the Pharaoh is going to ask the question that then will launch all of the next chapters of the book of Exodus, which are uh, the plagues. We're going to look not at the 10 plagues. We're going to look at a couple of them uh, for the sake of time to catch a rhythm that I want you to see. But I want you to look at uh, Exodus chapter 5. Go ahead and turn there to Exodus 5. And um, I want you to see here in Exodus chapter 5, verse uh, 2. Here's how all of this begins. Now, you know that Moses has been called out. Uh, the Lord has said, you're going to go. I'm going to be with you. I'm the great I am. I am the Lord. And they're going to know who I am. And then it says here in chapter 5, afterward, verse 1, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, and that word Lord, by the way, all caps, L-O-R-D, is the word Yahweh. I am who I am. Now we say Jehovah often. Uh, same word with some vowels added in there. But he is I am, the God of Israel. Let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. So he's basically saying just let them out. Let them come out here and be together. Hold a feast and worship me. But Pharaoh said, here it is, watch this. Who is the Lord that I should obey him. This is his question. Who is the Lord that I shall obey his voice and let Israel go? I don't know him and I'm not going to let the people go. Now listen, again, in our progressive modern mind, we think that we've come so far. But the problem of the human heart is still the problem of the human heart and its pride and its sin. That has not changed at all. Now we may have better medicine. We got faster cars. We got some technology, but we have not become better people. And so the question that Pharaoh is asking is actually a very modern question. 
I mean, think about it. Who, who's not asking that question? Particularly those who are, are not uh, believers. Who's the Lord? And here's the problem with many of us. You see, here's the, here's the thing. In, in America, about 95, 97% consistently, 97% of all Americans believe in God. Now, Pharaoh was a polytheist. It wasn't that he didn't believe in God. Moses comes along and says, the great I am is telling you that this needs to happen. Let my people go. And he says, I don't know him. It, didn't, it wasn't that he didn't believe in gods that could serve him ultimately, as we're going to see today. But instead, here's our problem. Many Americans don't have a problem with believing in God, like many of us even. But not a God is going to tell us what to do. Who is God? Who is the Lord that I should obey Him? I mean, I'll believe in God, but when He starts laying down some stuff that's going to fundamentally change my life, I'm out. And that's where many people live. That's where many uh, cultural Christians are. Maybe Christian, maybe not, but the God, God starts telling me what to do with my life and I'm out. That's basically what's going on here with, uh, with the Pharaoh. But here's what we're going to see today. Another part of this story is that, uh, you know, a lot of people struggle with God for, for various reasons. Uh, some think the God of the Old Testament is this wrathful, angry God. He's so harsh. He's so judgmental. And when we look at the plagues, I mean, you know, if you know the story at all, you're like, man, he's coming on strong. And, and you think that the God of the Old Testament is like this. And then we come over to the New Testament. We got Jesus. He's loving and kind. He's merciful. All of those things. But here's what the prophet Habakkuk says. Very important thing for us. Habakkuk 3, verse 2. He says, in wrath, remember mercy. Lord, in your wrath, Remember mercy. In wrath, be merciful. Can God be wrathful and merciful at the same time? Can I go through challenging times in my life, God allowing me to go through times in my life, or how about this, consequences of my own sin that lead me to, to big time troubles in my life, anxieties and worries and all kinds of struggles in my life. Can God bring that stuff upon me? in order to allow me to be rescued from myself, from my sin, in order to worship Him alone. You bet He can. In fact, the Puritans used to call it uh, severe, the severe mercies of God. That He would actually bring uh, His wrath or judgment upon us. And this is a foreign concept for those of us in the modern West. God's going to bring His punishment upon me? And show me His mercy in the process? Yes, that's exactly what He's going to do. And that's exactly what He does for us. Again, this is a hard message to hear. And it's going to be a hard one to apply. But here's the central truth of the message today. By His grace, through warnings and judgment, God lovingly draws us to Himself. By His grace, through warnings and judgment, God lovingly draws us to Himself. Now, now listen, parents. If you think that's a stretch, you do this with your children. By loving them, graciously loving them, you bring warning. Don't you, uh-uh, don't you do that. You bring judgment. Uh, here's the choice you just made. You're going to go to your room now. Or I'm going to take your iPad. Or wow, your iPhone. No! And, and, and here's what happens. No, that's the judgment that's come upon you because you've disobeyed. We all do this. This is not a foreign concept. And yet we pretend God can't do that. God doesn't do that. He's just too loving. So we think he's too harsh. He's unloving. He's unfair. But consider who's asking this question. Who is the Lord? This Pharaoh, he's not an innocent man. So if you have any sense of justice, there's another characteristic of God. He's all loving and he's all just at the same time. This guy is not a godly man. He's a brutal dictator. In fact, uh, he's overseeing the horrific abuse and oppression, the slavery of now probably 1.5 million people. And for 400 years, he and his predecessors have done so. A previous pharaoh, or possibly even the one in question here, ordered a mass genocide of every male Israelite baby that was killed 
at birth. We see that in Exodus chapter 1, verse 6. So turn to, uh, let's pick up the story in chapter 5 where we were just a moment ago. What happens after he asks the question is that Aaron and Moses go to him and they say, okay, come on, let the people out just as God commanded and we're going to go out in the wilderness, gather all the crowd. We're going to have this big giant Woodstock event. We're going to have a feast, not Woodstock, and we're going to worship God. And then Pharaoh says, hey, no, 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 no. No, what do you mean you're going to, you're even asking, requesting that you're going to take them away from and give them rest from their burdens, he says in, in verse 5 of chapter 5. Then he says, here's what's going to happen. We've been providing straw for all of these people making bricks. They're going to have to go get their own straw now. And in verse 7, and he says, we're by no means going to reduce their work. We're going to ramp it up. In fact, in verse 9, let heavier work come upon them. I mean, this guy is, is harsh. He is ruthless. And then in chapter 6, God brings the promise again. So look at here in chapter 6. And again, we're going to buzz through a couple of chapters, walk through the story here more than normal. So hang with me. Chapter 6, uh, we see five times in eight verses. God spoke to Moses in verse 2. Look at this. And said to him, I am the Lord. We see this phrase over and again. Go tell him, I am the Lord. You, you reveal to and, and this is the answer to Pharaoh's question. Who is the Lord? Watch this. We're about to show you. I mean, think about it. Who is God and why should I obey him? Uh-oh, this is not going to go well for you. And this is true for all of us. And we all do this. Who is God that he, he's going to tell me what to do? How dangerous is that? But it says five times, I am the Lord, verse 6. Verse 7, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of out, of, out from under the burdens of, of the Egyptians. That's what he's going to say. He says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is uh, verse 8. He says, I am the Lord. This is the message he's going to try to get across to Pharaoh. And then, of course, we know the Pharaoh's not going to listen. Turn to chapter 7. Here's what we see. Moses and Aaron before Pharaoh. They come before the Pharaoh. But it says here, now here's another twist in the story or a troubling theological challenge for us in the story. And that is this. It, you know, if some people look at the Old Testament or even the plagues and say, wow, uh, God is so harsh. He's so judgmental. He's so angry. Well, then you see in chapter 7, verse 3, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Okay, now, if you're thinking with me here, wait, so he's going to harden his heart and then if I know the story right, he's going to punish him and the people for hardening his heart because he has a hardened heart. What is going on there? Well, we're going to see. I'm going to make an effort to explain that one. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. I mean, God is saying up front, I'm going to harden his heart. He ain't going to listen. He's not going to listen to you at all. And then he says, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and I'll bring my host, my people, the children of Israel out. He's saying his heart's, his heart's going to be hardened, but it's going to end up in fuller glory of what I'm going to reveal. But I want you to see this in, in chapter uh, 7, verse 14. We see the first plague. Here it comes. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as, the, as, uh, as, as he come going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him. Now look at this dramatic moment. And take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, the Lord, there you go, the, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you saying, let my people go. So this is what he's already told him is going to happen. It's about to happen that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord. By this you shall know that I am the Lord. There's that phrase again. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile and it shall turn to blood. The fish in the Nile shall die and the Nile will stink and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. Everything is going to turn to blood. All the water in the Nile and around the Nile is going to turn to blood. So sure enough, they do so. 
And that's exactly what happens. In verse 21, and the fish in the Nile died and the Nile stank, you can imagine, uh, so that the Egyptians could not drink from the Nile. There is blood throughout all the land of Egypt. This is, this is horrifying stuff. But then it goes on to say in verse 22, but the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. Now, some have said these are either great magicians or they have some satanic, demonic powers. Now, you might say, well, I, I bet you they figured out some way to, to enter in some, some kind of dye into the water. It looks like blood. They kind of did the same thing. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and he would not listen to them. So he's going, wait, wait, no, no, this is not a miracle. You see, he now has his modern mind. They, I know there's another way. They figured out another way to do this. This is not a miracle of God. So he hardens his heart. Well, then I want you to see, not only then did we see the, the corresponding God happy. Again, H-A-P-I. It's, it's not, it's, I think it's funny that it's happy because they're seeking after this God to be happy. But now we see uh, in chapter 8, the second plague, which is the frogs. Now, can you imagine? So let's go to the second plague. We see then the corresponding God to this plague is uh, is the god Haket. The second plague is the frogs, and Haket is a god with a frog head. Now, if that sounds weird, when I was in India, and some of, some of you with me, we, we went to a Hindu temple, we went to a couple of them, and they're literally a god probably tied to this one, god with a with the frog head. And, and there's a god with the monkey body, a monkey head. I mean, it's just crazy stuff for us who know the one true god. But they would go and worship these gods and they would cry out to the frog god to, to, to offer uh, care and, and love for their families and for their children. So watch what happens. In chapter 8, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, watch this. He says, Here's what's going to happen. And this is exactly what happens. He, said, he calls it ahead of time. I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house. Now watch this. Check out the progression. They're going to come up into your house. They're going to get into your bedroom. They're going to come in your bedroom. Imagine this at your house. They're going to get in your bed, the bed of your houses. They're going to get on your servants. So these are now these are Hebrew people. Uh, so even the... Hebrews are going to be faced with some of this stuff, a couple of them. And then later, no longer, only the Egyptians. They're going to come into your, among your people, into your ovens and into your kneading bowls. The frogs will come up on you and your people and your servants. They're coming up out of the Nile. I mean, masses of frogs. They are coming up. They're going to come into your house. They're going to come into your bedroom. They're going to get up in your bed. They're going to come to your kitchen. They're going to come up in your bowls. Can you imagine? And every mom or woman in here is like, yikes. Every man in here, that's crazy stuff. And so they, they, they then, what happens is, here I even with this one, the magicians somehow, by their secret arts, and, and who knows, it could be demonic forces at work through them. Or it could be that they are summoning up somehow croaking frogs. They're able to bring frogs out of the Nile as well. And yet the frogs are everywhere. So Pharaoh pleads with Moses and he says in verse 8, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go sacrifice uh, to the Lord. So I'll give them a little reprieve. I'll let them go. Uh, but just do this. So Moses says, okay, tomorrow. That's exactly what we're going to do, he says in verse 10. And, and so you're going to know that there's no one like the Lord our God. He says, we're going to, we'll do this. So he thinks, hey, we're making some headway here. And, and then what happens is uh, the frogs die all out in the houses, courtyards, the fields. And they gather them up, verse 14, together in heaps. And the land stank, it says in verse 14. Can you imagine heaps of dead frogs? everywhere. And then in verse 15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, uh-oh, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Now listen, 
We could talk a long time here and I, and, and I won't, but some of us are going through challenges right now where the Lord is trying to get our attention. And he, I mean, he's been coming strong at you. You're facing the consequences of a particular attitude or sin, or maybe you fall into habitual sin. God has got your attention. For some of you, it's why you're here today. Some of you are saying, you know, I got to change this in my life. I feel like I'm on the edge over here. And then there comes respite. You know, for whatever reason, God eases up. Or you just think, you know what, I got this. I can handle this. And what happens is you say, you know what, I don't need the Lord anymore. I'm good. I'm good. I thought I needed him. I thought maybe. And then, nope, hardened heart. But look at this. He hardened his heart. It says in verse 15. Now it says the Pharaoh hardened his heart. See, a lot of people struggle with, wait, God hardened his heart or Now here we see Pharaoh hardened his heart and then come the gnats, the third plague. Can you imagine? The fourth plague flies. And then in verse 32, it says, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. So here's what I want to point out. Just real quick, this theological tension here. It seems that God and Pharaoh are a part of hardening his heart. I would suggest that Pharaoh had a hard heart going in. We know that this ruthless dictator, God puts him in position to reveal his hard heart. Moses comes and says, let my people go, thus says the Lord. And his heart gets harder. So, you know, God's putting him in position, but he's facing the consequences of his own hard heart. So uh, you could say that God placed him in uh, the occasion that would demonstrate an unyielding attitude. But you don't have to say necessarily that it was God. Now, he was the instigator and the initiator. He always is. He's in control. But you could argue he's not the author of the Pharaoh's defiance. He was already a man who was against the Lord and against justice and his people. But here's what I want us to do is we land this message now and apply it to our lives. Uh, Notice that there are corresponding plagues with each uh, false god. I should say, False gods corresponding to the plagues. Why is this? Because it goes back to Pharaoh's question, who is the Lord? And with every God that they worship, and then thousands more, but key gods that they worship, he attacks every one of them. And he says, I'm the, I am the Lord over these gods that you worship. They've got nothing for you and they've got nothing on me. See, here's the thing. The, 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 the first commandment that there is no other God before me is attached to this question, or really the answer, who is the Lord? I'll show you who the Lord is, is God's response. And he takes down every other false God because there is no other God. So here's the question I want to ask. What are the gods that we believe in? Now, I want you to think with me. Let the Spirit speak. What are the the gods that we believe in and thus serve? And you might say, I don't, Jeff, I don't have any gods in my life or idols. I don't worship a God who has a frog head or happy, the God of the Nile. I'm not, I, I, don't, I don't do that. And yet we all have a sense that, yeah, idols are still very much a thing. We may not build them and look at them. But the question I want to ask is this. What are the functional gods that you serve and worship? The ones that you trust in. And we all do that. We all have idols, gods in our lives. What corresponding plagues, listen to this, challenging question, might God bring into our lives so that we will turn to Him and worship Him alone? What if God's ultimate goal in your life, for you, for your good, and to His glory, is for you to worship Him and stop worshiping whatever idols you have in your life? What might He do to get our attention? Wow! This is a challenging question uh, that I've been wrestling with this week. The diagnostic question, what plagues might God unleash on us in order to show His supremacy in our lives? Again, you say, that's harsh. No, no, it's not. In His wrath, there is mercy. In His judgment, there's grace so that we turn to Him. So let's think about it. What are our idols in Dallas? Uh, They are many, But I want to just choose four. We looked at a couple of the ten. Let's look at four real quick and apply. This is where I'm seeking. You're seeking the Spirit to speak into your heart. Let's call them American idols. Can we do that? Let's consider the most common gods. 
that I see here in, in Dallas. And I've talked to others who would concur. First, comfort. Uh, second, control. Uh, third is success. And fourth is approval. Think about that. Comfort. You say, well, wait, what's wrong with comfort? Nothing until it becomes your functional God, your driving sense of ease and luxury and security. And I've got to have relief. And we end up pursuing this God of comfort. What about control? Where it's, the, it's this God of lordship who's in charge. You know, it's, it's living a life where I cover every possible contingency. I can control my own life. And then there's the God of success. This is the God of, you know, that, uh, it, or competence or performance. Success, we discover, is like a drug. Even if we're very successful, all things up and to the right. And they never are all the time. But even if they are most of the time, we begin to define ourselves that way and not worship the one true God. We'll always be left wanting. And then approval. So many of us, and not just our kids, who find themselves wondering, how many likes am I going to get? Or, or, or even as adults, I hope people will like me. And, and, and this is really a challenge, not only for men in regard to their performance, but women in terms of the way I look. Tell me I'm beautiful. I'll do anything to gain your approval if you'll simply tell me I'm beautiful. And so we pursue these gods. So let's talk about it. Our gods and the plagues that, that confront us. First, comfort. We're faced with the plague of inconvenience. You know that if you live long enough, you end up with, gosh, you have health matters. Some of you have had the flu. What an inconvenience that is, right? And we don't know what to do with it. It makes us crazy. Think about the next, uh, next plague that comes. It's the gnats. There's nothing worse than gnats. Hate gnats. Not as much as I hate mosquitoes, right? And in Texas, you're trying to just chill on a Texas summer night mosquitoes all around. You're going to get the West Nile virus. And there's nothing worse. A tiny little gnat making you crazy. Maybe you've had one at a picnic or maybe snuck into your house. We got a gnat in here. But can you imagine gnats all over the place where, where, where Moses just throws up dust essentially and they turn into gnats and they go all over the place. It happens with the boils that come upon the people. But think about it. Gnats will drive you nuts. The next one is flies. Flies will, will destroy the God of comfort. Make you wrestle with all kinds of thoughts. But here's what happens. The God of comfort, we can pursue it with everything we've got, but it'll never, ever sustain us. And God will bring discomfort into our lives so that we'll turn to Him. The next one is this control. The God of control is met with the plague of chaos. The plague of, of you could say, uh, mismanagement, which, which often, this, this idea of being in control, ironically, will lead us to addiction. So often, we, we're going to build this penetrable wall around ourselves. I'm going to control my life. No one's going to really know what's up in my, in my life because I'm going to control my environment. I'm going to control my image and we can never do it. Some of you have uh, read the, the famous poem Invictus uh, by William Hensley. He's on a hospital bed. He's an atheist. And the last two stanzas read like this. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Do you hear that? I am the captain of my soul. Listen, who is the Lord that I should obey him? And yet we read that. And if you put a beat behind that or if you put some Hans Zimmer kind of soundtrack behind that, I mean, some of us are like, yes, I'm the captain of my soul. We want to run through a wall, some of us. Guys do. You hear that? Because it resonates with the pride of the human heart. I'm in control of my life. And yet every addict here knows that the first of the 12 steps is to admit that, that our lives have become unmanageable that we are addicts and every one of us are addicted to sin and we are not the captains of our soul by a long shot. 
And yet the God of control takes us and then God brings the plague of chaos to rescue us. And so look at this next one, success. The plague of dissatisfaction results. The plague of, of failure, inability or loss or impotence. Some of you know that um, Tom Brady is going to be playing in the starting again in, uh, in the Super Bowl. He is the GOAT. I mean, there's, you can say what you will about him. You like him, don't like him. Patriots, you kidding me? Eagles, no. But instead, we've got Tom Brady and he is the greatest of all time. Uh, there's no arguing. He's going into his eighth Super Bowl. He's won five. And yet some years ago, some of you seen a famous interview that was on 60 Minutes. He'd only won a couple, maybe three, four Super Bowls at that time. And he's talking to Steve Croft and, and he says, he's, he's talking, he says, you know, in a moment of, I think, unexpected kind of vulnerability, he says, uh, everybody's like, man, this is the guy. He's got it all together. He's won all this. You know, I mean, he's, he's married to a model, supermodel. He's got billions of dollars. And then he says, he says, and, and I just ask, sometimes I wonder, is, is this all there is? Is this it? And then Steve Croft asked this question. Well, what's the answer? And Brady says, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Now, I, I pray, I hope that Tom Brady comes to know the answer. And it's not found in football. When a guy like that retires with great success, he finishes playing football and, and most often... They don't know who they are anymore. And, and there's even this dissatisfaction in success. The pinnacle, pinnacle of success and plagued with dissatisfaction. Because only God can fill the human heart. And, and, and only God can, can bring to us the success that's found in Him. And then finally, lastly, this God of approval is met with the plague of rejection. Some of us, we cannot stand rejection. It leads to disapproval, condemnation. We can't handle it. We can't live with it. So how do we discern our idols? I've told you before, your deepest emotions will point you to your idols. This is such an important exercise for you to, 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 to dive into. Whatever makes you really angry will point you to your idols. Whatever makes you really happy will point you to your idols. What are you anxious about? What do you worry about? It'll point you to your idols. What do you lay in bed at night thinking about, worrying about? You need to, you need to do a diagnostic on that because it'll point you to your idols. And, and I want us all just to, Lord, this week, show me, reveal to me the idols in my life. Our idols come with a built-in corresponding plague. The, tr the struggles that you're facing, that I'm facing in my life, if I'm, if I'm mindful, if I'm pursuing the Lord, allowing the Spirit to speak into my heart, these consequences of our sin, these plagues that come are, are like, they help us. It's almost like spiritually predictable to know here's what's happening in my life. And He does all of this because He loves us. The first commandment is tied to the great love of God and to this question, who is the Lord? He is the God of hosts. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the only one that can fill your heart with His love. We'll pursue all of these other gods and the plagues will come. His wrath will come at us in order to draw us to Himself. What if, here's what Paul says in the book of Romans, chapter 9, verse 22. What if God, although choosing to show His wrath and make His power known, bore with great patience the objects of His wrath prepared for destruction? What if He did this to make the riches of His glory known to the objects of His mercy, whom He prepared in advance for glory? Now, what is He saying here? The objects of His wrath. That's us. The objects of His wrath are those who've turned from Him and are not seeking after Him. And He says, what if the objects of His wrath are actually objects of His mercy? Now, how does that happen? Christ comes. He lives the perfect life on our behalf. So we don't have to because we couldn't. He dies the, the death, a sacrificial death on our behalf. And what happens on the cross then, we see that God in His wrath upon His Son remembers mercy. And we see then this, this, this unending grace, His unconditional love. Yes, the loving God 
that we know and worship and His inflexible holiness, which brings about judgment and justice, collide on the cross and salvation is made possible for us. And it all happens because Christ gives Himself. God brings mercy for sinners and judgment on sin because of Christ who dies on the cross for us. You see, without the cross, we have no hope. We continue to worship these gods and the plagues of the greatest plague of sin and shame are still upon us. We cannot escape it. We find purpose and ultimate satisfaction in God alone. The message of the plagues is this. In His wrath, He remembers mercy. And in the cross, in His wrath towards sin, He remembers mercy. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake, He who knew no sin became sin for us in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. We might be completely loved, fully accepted, totally approved by Him. Friends, stop running after your gods that will not satisfy and will ultimately crush you and turn your heart to the one true God, the great I Am. Let's pray together. I just want you now, with your heads bowed and eyes closed before the Lord, this is between you and God, Uh, that He would reveal to you, as He has even in this time, the gods that you worship. Or maybe you're looking at the plagues that you're experiencing, the challenges of your life. What do those say about your gods, your idols? And if you've not received Christ, friend, you are under the wrath and punishment of an almighty God. And He's calling out to you. He's drawn you here today. Many of us are walking through challenging times in our lives and it's because God is, by His mercy, is calling us to Himself. Turn to Him. Repent of your sin. And give your life to Him. God, we thank You for Jesus, our only hope, our Lord, our God. We praise You for the cross. And I ask God that every person here will now do holy uh, business with you, that your spirit would convict us and we'd never be the same. May we respond now to what you have said to us and obey and see who the Lord is, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen and amen.